Hello, welcome to Nutrition Therapy by Lucy. This is a channel where we talk about food, good nutrition, and health. Thank you for your support, for always watching my videos, subscribing, but most importantly, for consuming my content. I am so grateful. And today, we are going to talk about non communicable diseases, and we are going to measure on diabetes and hypertension because I feel like they are the major MCDs that are that are taking the higher note or they are on a rise on a daily basis and to take us through is Dr. Tari. Yeah. Dr. Tari Karibu Sana. Thank you so much. And thank you for honoring our invitation. Thank you, you're welcome. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> so, um, hello everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Wangari Mwangi. Uh, I'm a general practitioner and I am uh, thankful for uh, being this, in this uh, forum and uh, I hope you will learn a lot. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. And Doctor, let us just start. Who is at risk of diabetes and hypertension? Okay, so basically, um, the various factors, uh, risk factors that are related to a patient or rather anyone um, developing uh, diabetes and hypertension. So basically, we look at patient people who are taking a lot of consuming a lot of alcohol, uh, patients who are consuming a lot of. Um, uh, you know, smoking, smoking tobacco. Mm -hmm. Tobacco has been found to be one of the risk factors for, you know, developing this uh, non-communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. Then also diet. Diet is a very um, major or rather important risk factor in the development of um, non-communicable diseases. Because when you look at diet, basically, um, if your diet is, um, you know, has high cholesterol, basically, you're at risk of developing what we call hyperlipidemia, that is you have high cholesterol levels. And when you have high cholesterol levels, it means you're at risk of developing um, the non-communicable disease, that is the hypertension and the diabetes. And most of the times, the risk factors for hypertension and the diabetes are usually the same. And then of course, patients who are physically inactive, patients who just have sedentary lifestyle, they don't have any you know, form of uh, physical activity. And then of course, patients who have um, coexisting um, conditions, for example, uh, uh, for example, heart conditions, renal conditions, and I'll discuss it as we continue, and how basically how these um, pre-existing conditions can predispose you to getting um, hypertension and diabetes as well. And so, Dr. Hayek, yeah. about the sedentary lifestyle. So, yeah. what to anchor morning runs? Yeah, so the gym, basically. What are some of the maybe simple workouts you can do at the comfort of your home. The comfort of your home. So, basically, uh, what I mean by sedentary lifestyle is patients or other people who just have, you know, they wake up in the morning, go to work by, you know, like going, you know, by car or by, you know, taxi, Uber, Uber services. And then they still sit in the office the whole day and then go back home by either like driving or like just sitting down basically. That's someone who's having a sedentary lifestyle. Or rather someone who just works at home. They just wake up in the morning, they're on the laptop every day, and they're not doing any form of activity. So basically what I mean by uh, you now trying to, you know, cap that is by, you know, like doing simple exercises, like by taking morning, morning walks, um, evening walks, doing aerobics, you know, like they're called Zumba. You can just do that in the house. You don't even have to go to the gym. Yeah, just, you know, like you can use the staircase as your as you're going to work instead of like taking the lift, you can as well decide to, you know, like, t um, you know, go, go up the stairs. And then de definitely just walking simple walks. Then of course, as you continue, you'll definitely find a way of um, trying to, you know, have a, a healthy exercise um, plan. So basically like by, by joining a gym, maybe you can be doing once or twice a week and then maybe trying and finding out, maybe you can even do a uh, at-home workout and, you know, things like that. And how, yeah. important, how important is maybe those physical exercises for your heart to yeah. control of your blood sugar? Blood sugar. And so basically I talked about um, the risk factors mm -hmm. to you know um, diabetes and hypertension. And when you look at the pathophysiology or, or rather etiology of how these um, conditions come in, uh, I talked about um, high, high cholesterol levels, high, high lipid levels, yeah? Mm -hmm. so. So we were talking about how diabetes and hypertension, uh, uh, the role of exercise in you know, reducing the risk factor for uh, the development of diabetes and hypertension. So basically when you exercise, you're trying to reduce the, the levels of cholesterol that you have in the body. I talked about cholesterol being a risk factor for the development of uh, this non-communicable diseases. Okay, and so Dr. Yeah. then before diabetes and hypertension were regarded as condition for the old age. 
Are we still saying there are no gonjo zawaze? <laughs> Not really. So maybe I can tackle the question and discuss the diabetes and hypertension differently. Mm -hmm. So for diabetes, we have very, very many types of diabetes. We have um, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, we have metabolic syndromes, and we also have gestational diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is, the, you know, um, it's called um, an autoimmune condition where, um, you know, the, because basically, remember, insulin uh, is required in reducing or rather regulating uh, blood glucose. So anything that is, so there's an autoimmune condition that usually um, affects the, the, the production of insulin. So basically you find even like months, uh, to anyone below 30 years mm -hmm. developing diabetes, so that, that is called type 1 diabetes. Even for the children. Even for the children. So you find that someone has a child who is diabetic, so that's type 1 diabetes. Okay. Then we have type 2 diabetes now. Type 2 diabetes is now where the notion was it's the old. But basically even someone who is 35, 38, 40 years, 40 years is considered young, it's not considered old. Yeah, they can develop, <laughs> they can actually develop um, yeah. diabetes. Mm -hmm. Then we also have the metabolic syndromes, basically it's you know, uncontrolled uh, sugars also in that range of above 30 years. And then we have gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes is diabetes uh, you develop during pregnancy. You don't have the history of diabetes before, but then when you get pregnant, you, you develop um, diabetes. This can mean that you can have the diabetes after the pregnancy, or it can also mean that you can basically control your sugars um, just during the, you'll get diabetes during the pregnancy, mm -hmm. but then after the pregnancy, your sugars will be well controlled. So find a 21 year old um, girl, she's pregnant, she, then she develops gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. So definitely she, she might be at risk of developing now the type two diabetes later in life mm -hmm. because of that um, history of the gestational mm -hmm. diabetes. And then for hypertension, basically, um, yeah, it was known that, uh, the old are the ones who have um, hypertension, but there are two types of um, hypertension basic based on classification. Mm -hmm. So we have the essential hypertension, which we, we, we don't know the cause. It's actually the 90% 90, 90 of the patients who have hypertension have essential hypertension. Mm -hmm. Then we have secondary hypertension. Secondary hypertension is where we can be able to tell that this is the cause of hypertension. So you can find uh, uh, maybe an 18 year old, mm -hmm. 16 year old, having the hypertension you're wondering why is this young person developing hypertension so they have secondary hypertension uh meaning uh but not necessarily that the 16 year old can have secondary hypertension they can also have essential hypertension but most of the times when you see this young um patients having hypertension you need to find the cause because most probably they're having identifiable causes of the hypertension but even a 20 30 year old um, person can develop hypertension, that is the essential hypertension, and it's because of the risk factors we talked about, the diet, the, you know, the physical inactivity, the smoking, the alcohol, because I mean, many people in our generation uh, take a lot of um, alcohol, take a lot of, uh, they smoke a lot, and their diet is something to be talked about, and so, it's, yeah. And it's family history part of the essential. And definitely, and family history can be a risk factor for developing essential hypertension. If you know your parents are having uh, hypertension if you you know like immediate family members are having hypertension the same case to um, diabetes as well so yeah family history is also um, a, a risk factor for development of these conditions okay if yeah. we started even without maybe telling our audience how high and how low <laughs> is diabetes and hypertension like what we are the have a standard level. Okay. The standard level of blood pressure, regardless if of your age, okay. the status for the that is for the pregnant moms. How okay. When is blood pressure regarded as high? Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe I can start with I can discuss hypertension briefly and then diabetes. Um, so for hypertension, what is hypertension? You know, many people are asking, or rather they ask themselves, what is hypertension? So hypertension is basically when you have persistent or abnormally high blood pressure. Basically, for, for, you, for, for your vessels, um, because, you know, like blood passes through your vessels, mm -hmm. and there's a standard pressure that is required Mm, that is required now to to to, to you know like to 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 move the the blood now from the organs um, to from now the heart now to the organs because that is, that is the function of the arteries yes. and basically when you're talking about high blood pressure we, we're looking at the arterial arteri arterial uh, blood pressure so basically blood pressure is a factor of many things it's a factor of the cardiac output cardiac output is basically the amount of blood that is you know coming from from the heart so cardiac output 
in now our peripheral resistance. These factors are, are very important, especially because anything that affects um, the cardiac output and anything that affects the heart rate. Okay, so for the normal for 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 the normal um, blood pressure, uh, so we talk about anything uh, 120 over 80. That is the the blood pressure that is. Uh, considered as normal 120 120 over 80 the upper reading yeah the upper reading. that is the upper li uh, the systolic the upper reading is called systolic blood pressure mm -hmm. so that's 120 um we like we should giving a range so uh, anything uh, between you know 100 120 there and then 80 to 90 there that is that that is the diastolic mm -hmm. Now, for hypertension, now we have uh, different grades. You look at, there are very different, uh, there are very many guidelines that uh, try and, you know, classify the hypertension. There are other guidelines I talk about, like there is the high normal, and then there's a grade one and grade two um, hypertension, basically. So you'll see some other studies are talking about any high normal, meaning your blood pressure is between 130 to 140. That is the systolic, that is the above one. And then anything uh, between uh, 80 to 90, or that, that is the diastolic, mm -hmm. so that is a high normal. So you find a patient who has anything up, like 130 over 85, you will tell them this pressure is is normal but on the higher side. So that these are the patients where you will now incorporate the diet, the exercise, because they are on the verge of developing uh, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then for grade one, uh, anything now 140, 90. So grade one, uh, there are some studies you'll, or rather some books you'll see they're talking about anything between 140 um to uh, to 150 or other 149 and then the uh, the diastolic 90 to 99 okay and then now for grade 2 so 150 to 160 or other 150 to 159 and then the lower one is 90 to 99 okay and then now grade 3 is now when you're having hypertensive emergencies anything above 160 if anything above 100 that is for the diastolic so in summary, we talked about the normal being 100 and 120 or over over a over 80. Then anything, so we have the high normal that anything above between 130, uh, 130, 120, 130, then 80, uh, 90. So anything above 140, 90 that is re regarded as hypertension. Then now above that, now we classify in terms of grade one and grade two. The purpose of this uh, classification is going to help us in terms of management because you'll see anyone who's like, for example, I was talking about that patient who comes with a high blood pressure or rather a pressure of 135 over 80, 85 basically. That's someone you don't, you won't start medications, but then you'll tell them your, high, your blood pressure is high today. Uh, so we need to consider, you know, these factors, for example, diet and exercise. For diabetes, basically, uh, we look at various um, modalities in terms of diagnosing um, diabetes. So for a normal, so we do like the, the commonest test we do is a random blood sugar. So we're just you can, a random meaning you've just eaten, walk if, yeah, you walk in, and um, we do the, the random blood sugar. Then we have another one which is called a fasting, where like we do it very early in the morning where the patient has not eaten. So we say the patient eats the previous night, uh, you know, they, they take dinner basically, but then they don't take anything past 12. So they have fasted for like eight hours, yeah? So basically that's a fasting. And then we have other modalities, for example, the OGTT, but those ones that we do for, we don't do it for a walk-in patient, a patient who comes in and we don't do, we do, we do it for patients who now are at risk or patients who now have uh, established diabetes. So for the random blood sugar, anything um, between uh, four or rather 4.5 to around 11. But for a patient who comes with a, we, we do a random and it's above 10, 10 to 11, that is a patient who we call it pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. The same case I was talking to, I was talking about the patient who comes in with a blood pressure of 135, 85. Yeah. It's the same, same patient who uh, has a, a random of 10 to 11, not taking any medication, that is a patient who is pre-diabetic. This is the patient we need to find out what, what, what is, we need to do investigations to find, because it's a patient who, in future, if we don't do anything, might be a candidate for developing um, diabetes. Then basically for fasting, we look up uh, for at, uh, at levels between 4.4 4 and around 7.5. Okay. Yes. Okay, and talking about pre-diabetes, is it reversible? And maybe you can take us some of the lifestyle modifications that you can do to reverse the, the conditions. Yeah. So it's both for both uh, diabetes and hypertension mm -hmm. because these are patients who are considered not diabetic or hypertensive, mm -hmm. but they are pre for for diabetic for, for diabetes basically we call them pre-diabetic 
uh, they have pre-diabetic pre um, levels. So yes, it is reversible. There are very many patients who come in with, you know, the sugars between, you know, 10, 11 there. We don't start them on medications then, uh, but we encourage uh, them to, you know, have, you know, the exercise. Do that two things, exercise and uh, diet. Those are, the, those are the two main things. And I think for you, the diet, you, 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 you can basically like, you know, you tell us like, you know, because I mean, nutrition, uh, is a very very important aspect in in in, in this uh, particular patients, and then uh, so because you see these patients have the risk factor. Maybe they are smoking a lot. Maybe they are taking a lot of alcohol. Maybe maybe they have the family history, and uh, maybe they have uh, you know they're taking some certain medications that are increasing the the sugars, or maybe they're, they're increasing the blood pressures. So these patients we can tell them oh do this, do that, it can actually reverse. Same case to the patient who comes in with those pressures that I was talking about. Just try and identify whatever is causing. Because you can even talk to them and say they take fast foods, Monday to Monday, they take a lot of alcohol. So you can try and reverse that and then now work with them. Because at the end of the day, maybe they can, their, their pressures or sugars can normalize or it can get worse. Because now they're not keen in those aspects we've talked about in terms of diet and exercise. Yeah. Um, there's no okay because and is it possible? <laughs> okay, I, I don't advise to for you to take every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not practical. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, especially for okay, maybe I can talk about maybe patients who are at risk, and then maybe for example, you know, for for, for any patient who comes in the hospital, mm -hmm. even if they have headache, even if they have any condition, we we basically do um, those tests. Okay, for it. Every time you go to the hospital, yes, mm. they do take your blood pressure. Yeah. But at the one we want, we need. <laughs> una, ni una in the consultation. In the too. consultation. <laughs> yeah, you need to be communicating these things. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a gap um, that is existing in our hospitals. And I think it's important to, you know, communicate with the patient and tell them the findings of, you know, like the blood pressure or like sugars. But uh, for any patient who is properly admitted or for any patient who comes in with uh, certain symptoms, mm -hmm. we try and, you know, do the sugars, we do the blood pressure. But then you had asked about how often should we, you know, like, uh, do the the random sugars and the yeah. blood pressure. I think uh, it's important to, at, at least for 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 a patient who does not have any diagnosis of diabetes and hypertension. Mm -hmm. I think you should be doing a random sugar at least once a month. Mm -hmm. um, pressures, if possible, again the same at least uh, mm -hmm. once or twice a month. But then there are patients who come to the hospital and then we see maybe they've just come with pain you know they just come with you know this certain diagnosis mm -hmm. and then we notice that the sugar is you know towards the higher side mm -hmm. we notice that the blood pressure is towards the higher side mm -hmm. those are the patients we now tell them mm -hmm. uh, okay in relation to the diet and exercise uh, modifications these are the patients now we tell them to do what we call number one serial monitor uh, bp monitoring mm -hmm. so what serial bp monitoring is uh, it means you do probably every day or almost every day. Almost every day means we have seven days in a week, so I'll tell you to do like four times in a week. Okay. okay. The patients, the people who don't have access to the, you know, the machines, the people who actually have the machines at home. So they, they do, if they have the machine at home, they can do it every day and at least they monitor. This is important because um, maybe there's something I, I, I didn't talk about. It's called white coat hypertension. White coat hypertension is a patient who comes in, they're very anxious, they're very stressed because of coming to the doctor, so their pressures just shoot up. They're not hypertensive. So these are the patients who, you know, like uh, they'll come, the high, their pressure is very high. We repeat, it's normal. Okay? So, but there are patients who they come, the pressure is high, we repeat, it just goes down a bit, but it's not towards the normal. So these are the patients, we won't start medications, yes, but we tell them to do the serial BP monitoring, then they come back to the hospital, we review the, the, the BPs as well. Same case to the sugars as well, the, especially the patients who have, you know, the, they are pre-diabetic, yeah, the ones who have not started uh, medications, but they are, their sugars were a bit on the higher side, so we tell them to maybe do twice, thrice a week, and then now we can be able to monitor them after. So yeah.
Dr. Kamume, to me, this is a visor you've been talking about diabetes and hypertension. How are the two related? Because me, me, Gumu Sana, once you are diagnosed with diabetes, like two months down the line, hypertension checks in. How yeah. are the two related? Okay. So, there are very many, basically, I said medicine is evidence based, mm -hmm. and there are very many theories. Uh, related to the two, <laughs> but basically, from my understanding, on from you know, basically from the pathophysiology of both, if a patient has um, diabetes, for example, remember I talked about the risk factors of both being the same. Yeah. So this is a patient who most probably has high uh, lipid, high cholesterol levels, mm -hmm. and I talked about um, development of uh, atherosclerosis. Basically, atherosclerosis is you know development of plaque or rather the cholesterol deposits in the vessels. Remember, I talked about um, something we called uh, peripheral um, vascular resistance or rather the vascular factors in relation to the control of uh, pressure. So can you imagine, like I usually like giving this example, pipes. You see these pipes, uh, I think water pipes or oil pipes, then you have a lot of, you know, like debris in the pipes. So what happens is you have a lot of debris in the pipes and then the flow of whatever is passing, either the, the, if it's water, if it's oil, is going to be increased. So it's the same, same thing. This is a patient who has either hypertension, diabetes, but diabetes, uh, they have a lot of, you know, cholesterol in the, in the vessels, yeah? So if you have a lot of cholesterol in the, in the vessels, then it means that the integrity of the vessel is interfered with, so you have a lot of um, resistance in the vessels. And that's how you develop a hypertension, especially for a patient who has um, diabetes. So they have high cholesterol levels, they're not, so we call them the hyperlipidemias, basically. And you can imagine, like if the upper limit is like five, and this is a patient who has like more than 200, 300, so someone who has a lot of you know, cholesterol in the blood, so it means that um, the integrity of uh, the vessel is interfered with, and they develop hypertension. But most of the times, um, the link, uh, the link between the two is uh, there are very many uh, theories. But I think the one for the cholesterol is what one which is understood, uh, and it's understood, and it's actually uh, makes sense because if you have a high high cholesterol, it means um, your, your your vessels are interfered with, and then you develop hypertension. Okay, if you're not able for if you're not able anything that interferes with um, production. For example, when you have for, for patients who have central obesity, uh, patients who have uh, you know they are obese. These are patients who are not the insulin becomes resistant because basically type two the hallmark of type two is insulin. Insulin is there, but then it's resistance to the organs. For type one, insulin is not there because the pancreas is destroyed. But for type 2, which is the most, you know, common, especially in, you know, like 30, 40, 50 years, you have a lot of, you know, cholesterol, you have a lot of, you know, like obesity. So your insulin becomes resistant and that's how you develop diabetes. Then again, the, the, the cholesterol develops, um, you know, it, like it is it's present in the vessels and you develop hypertension. So I think now it's like a, it's like a circle, basically, it's a vicious cycle. And yeah. before doctor talking about hypertension, it's known as a silent killer. Yeah. And there may be some of the classical signs of those two red flags that you yeah. can identify. Yeah. As it can be, I have a, maybe I could be hypertensive, I could be diabetic. Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, yes, it's true. Both hypertension and diabetes are silent killers. Uh, as I talked about, uh, the patients who are walking uh, outside and they have diabetes, hypertension, and they don't know. Just go hyper, hyper. Yeah, they, so basically what happens is, maybe I can start with hypertension and then I go to diabetes. So for hypertension, these are patients, you know, hypertension is gradual, you know. Mm -hmm. By the time a patient comes with symptoms, that is someone who has very, very high uh, blood pressures, yeah. You talked about it being a silent killer, it's true. Mm -hmm. Many people are working with high, you know, levels of, you know, high blood pressure in the streets mm -hmm. and they don't know. So what, when a patient comes, what, we, what do we look for? We do a thorough examination. We're looking for complications because this is a patient who's been having the constant, you know, high blood pressures. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for is, in same case to diabetes, this is a patient who comes with, with sugars unrecordable. We've talked about the normals. This is a patient who's coming with sugars of 30, you know, and when it's unrecordable, meaning it's above even what the glucometer can actually measure. So what we're looking for is uh, complications. So this is a patient who comes, um, uh, for example, a hypertensive patient comes but most of the times they usually come up with hypertension, diabetic patient, they come, they have stroke. It's a patient who comes, they have heart failure. When they have heart failure, the things we look at, for example, they have difficulty breathing, you know, like they have uh, edema, 
you know, they have ascites. Ascites means they because of the heart failure, the, they have a lot of overload, yeah. So they have um, a lot of yeah, fluid in the body. So they already have the complications. That those are the things we look for when the patient comes. Uh, but but I think uh, this patient also comes with stroke. They have you know hemiparesis, you know, because of they've been just walking around with you know high 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 pressures. They don't know. Then they collapse in the streets. Okay. Uh, again, this is also a patient who maybe the hypertension, the high blood pressure has affected the kidneys, mm -hmm. so they come with you know urine, urine, urine retention or rather the, 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 the kidneys are not functioning, okay? Mm -hmm. So they have those complications. Mm -hmm. For diabetes, is the same. This is a patient who's, have, who's been having high sugars, who's been living that sedentary lifestyle, who's not been caring about anything, comes with sugars unrecordable, comes unconscious. Because basically when you have those high sugars, I mean, you're basically you are unconscious and we call it diabetes ketoacidosis basically mm -hmm. so you're having heavy breathing you're having you, you know like a lot taking a lot of water you you, you take you're going to, to to for short call very frequently because it's because the body is trying to remove the sugars the that is in the blood condition. exactly mm -hmm. so by the time a patient comes we're just looking for the for the complication the red flags you're talking about mm -hmm. a patient comes with unconscious for example in the hour in the accident in emergency this is a patient who you need to do you know your your test and the first thing you have to do is a random sugar. Mm -hmm. You'll be shocked that this patient has unrecordable sugars. This is a patient who is unconscious, so you need to do um, imaging for the brain because it's a patient who might be having um, hemorrhage, might be having a cerebral, cerebrovascular accident, basically a stroke, you know? So those, those are the red flags we look for. For a patient who comes and walks in, uh, what are the red flags? There's a patient who comes and just saying, I have a headache. A mm -hmm. uh, patient who comes in with frequent urination, patient comes in with uh, you know they're taking a lot of water very frequently uh, they're obese that's a red flag from the beginning a patient who comes with an obese that's a red flag you know so there are those symptoms we look at and then we advise them um, accordingly yeah okay. wow <laughs> mm. personally i'm learning a lot kama kuchukua notebook na na pen you are missing out on very important topic and i think the most important thing when you, when it comes to red flags is please don't wait uh, don't wait to, 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 you know, to, to develop the symptoms. I think it can't be uh, emphasized enough that uh, just do your exercises, um, diet, do your, your checkups, do your sugars, do your pressures. Because if you're doing them frequently, then you'll be told by your, your physician or your doctor, the one who's been following up, you'll be told your sugars are on the higher side, mm -hmm. your pressures are on the higher side. But you see many of us, they just wait until we are very sick and then we go to the hospital. But I think these things can be capped. If you have a family history of diabetes, that's already a red flag. Just know your diabetes. Yes, history. if you're already having a history of obesity, mm -hmm. or you're already obese at 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. even below, even nowadays we see, you know, children. Uh, children the obesity yeah. in children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The red, that's a red flag, you know. So don't wait until you develop the symptoms. I, I can't say it enough. Don't wait until you get a stroke mm -hmm. so that you're diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension. I think it's that I think it's quite unfortunate. Yeah, we can't and then exactly no no no. I think it's mm -hmm. it should be a routine for Kenyans mm -hmm. to be going to the hospital, especially for men. Because men are the ones who wait until everything is wrong. For ladies a bit they they're they're not feeling well, you know, they're feeling you know, they're taking they're concerned about the symptoms. But I think for men they're a bit naive about the symptoms, so please Let's. Yeah, no, 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 no. Let it not be like that. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it comes to your health. Yeah. Yeah. And so, doctor, let's talk about. Unaunanga like the hypertensive and diabetic patients. Badawa zimeja komite. Into rezafanya into this this pill bad and it's too much. Okay. Um, there are combinations of uh, these medications mm -hmm. uh, for management, basically for hypertension, diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, the management is different. Maybe we can start with uh, hypertension. Mm -hmm. So basically, depending on the grades you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are very many guidelines. I think maybe our viewers can, you know, check it out out of curiosity. <laughs> because sometimes it's good to know what your, your doctor is giving you. Just don't allow your doctor to just give you something and you're like, ah, may I take the white pill? You don't even know. <laughs> sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good to know. I feel like sometimes it's good to know mm -hmm. which medications you're taking. Ask the doctor why, uh, what is the you know, mechanism, how will it help me, mm -hmm. you know. So that, I mean, it's, it's, your, it's your body. You need to, mm -hmm. for me, I feel like it's important. Just don't be given something and you're told, ah, this one will help in your, you. Know, it's good to know because, I mean, even if you're not a medic, 
it's yeah. your own body you need to know so you talked about peel button so basically depending on the grades uh we like um starting uh there are very many uh, guidelines so i think we as doctors should follow the guidelines mm -hmm. for grade one hypertension uh we start with um one just one medication okay. then we go as we continue because you see sometimes a patient who comes they only have one uh drug and it's not controlling so we add another one but the good thing about um our you know like our system in terms of like medication is various companies are coming up with combination of medications yes. yeah even you can i i follow up very many patients who have a, one tablet which is a combination of three but the only problem is they're very expensive and you know um our catchment population most of uh, our population cannot be able to afford um the medication so that's why we're not to they have both diabetes and hypertension and they have so many medications but I feel like they can, you know, we, we can try and continue um, advocating for, um, you know, the use of those combinations, uh, yeah, so, so that we can be able to reduce the pill burden as well. Yeah. Even for the diabetes, there's the combinations of the of the medications. And maybe when you, I know you can talk about drug adherence. you just control your your condition with diet only. Okay, by the time, um, okay, maybe I talked about this. Mm -hmm. So in relation now to the patients who are, who are pre-diabetic mm -hmm. and the patients who are at risk, mm -hmm. those ones are the ones who we can uh, advocate for diet and exercise alone. But you see, a patient coming with stroke, yeah, that's sure. not a patient who you just tell them to exercise and diet. Mm -hmm. A patient who's coming already with sugars which are above 30, mm -hmm. that's not a patient who will tell them. There's room. And you see, that's why I, I, I tell people, just go to the hospital and be checked because there's room to reverse the condition yeah. with diet and exercise alone. But you see, for a patient who's coming with pressures of above 80, 180, mm -hmm. 90, that's not a patient I'll tell, by there you go home and exercise, no. Diet and exercise will be part of the plan, but they have to take medications. Yeah. Wow, and so Dr. maybe can, you can give us your take. Why do you think we have the NCDs, especially diabetes and hypertension is rising on a daily basis? Yeah. <laughs> that's a question that very many people ask and uh, that's a question that uh, many people want the answers. <laughs> but I think for from my experience as a doctor and also from you know like the trials, you know, like the you know, like what what we've been been able to see and identify is mm -hmm. there are modifiable risk factors. Mm -hmm. Modifiable means you can be able to modify. Yeah. Of course there are the non modifiable risk factors, for example the type one. Mm, diabetes. I'd like to have your take on why do you think the, the rates of NCDs, especially diabetes and hypertension, is on a higher rate on a daily basis? Um, it's because of the risk factors that you're talking about, mm -hmm. and most of them are uh, modifiable. Mm -hmm. For example, a patient diet, you know, the alcohol, the smoking, the family history. You can work on them. You can work on them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, because, but, they are, but because we need to identify that there are also the non-modifiable risk factors mm -hmm. that we can't do anything about. For example, um, the pre-existing conditions that we talked about, mm -hmm. and also, like for example, the secondary hypertension. If you have an existing renal mm -hmm. uh, or other kidney disease, there's nothing mm -hmm. uh, much you can do. But for the modifiable risk factors, mm -hmm. there are things that people ignore, in the, on, you know, on a, on a lifetime basis. So yeah, that's the reason why it's on the higher side because it's something that people can be able to mm -hmm. do something about it, but they are not doing anything about it. So they're just ignorant. They're ignorant <laughs> so for the modifiable risk so factors. Modifiable. Yeah. Exactly. And so Dr. Maybe you can just give us general tips to a healthy lifestyle. Number one is loving yourself in terms of going for checkups. Okay. Number going for checkups, the, the, the importance is you're just going to see how your sugars are, how you you know you're going for wellness checkups. You want to see that there's a gap. Number two, diet. And I think she's done so many videos on that, so I think you can. We can't emphasize much in terms of diet and then exercise. I mean, there's just just inc incorporate the exercise in your in your you know in your lifestyle. And I think for me, that those are the three main things uh, when it comes to uh, leading a, a healthy um, lifestyle. Okay. Oh, thank you, Doctor. That has been our conversation on NCDs and major on diabetes and hypertension. And so, Dr. maybe you can give us your parting shot. Napia, what you 
<laughs> okay, uh, so basically we've discussed uh, the hypertension and diabetes and I hope uh, people have been able to understand uh, the correlation between the two and I hope people can, for, for the people who have already the, the, the diabetes and hypertension, you can still lead a, you know, a normal uh, lifestyle even with the conditions, you're just uh, incorporating the diet, um, the exercise and also taking your medications as well. Uh, for me, uh, basically, I'm just a, I'm a general practitioner. Uh, mm -hmm. I just uh, do uh, low comes. I do I work with AAR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe the ones the patients who come to AAR, maybe they can they can find me there for maybe social media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for social media, uh, on Instagram, I'm called uh, Wangai MD. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I'm basically. Uh, I'm usually, <laughs> you know, like Sana. I'm usually there much. Instagram, okay. not Facebook, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, but I'm still trying to find my account. My account was hacked, so that's the reason why I'm not on Facebook much, but I'm, I'm on Instagram. And thank you, yeah. Sana, Dr. for enlightening us. I think to yeah. be so mingi. I hope to have you again here to ongelea another medical condition yeah. as we continue educating the public. So thank you, make sure you subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and also leave your comment up, let me know kama ukona, ukona diabetes, hypertension, how you're managing the condition, and also share so that we can be able to reach a wider audience. Thank you, until next time, bye bye.